Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we'll be diving into the key arm of Napoleon's most implacable foe. The infantry of a nation that while mighty had never been truly great. A country that was forced at the point of a French sabre to drag itself from the medieval world and enter the early modern one. The infantry of Austria-Hungary. Now just a quick note before we get started. I might use the term Austria or Austrian quite a lot. And if I do I mean Austro-Hungary as a whole. If I say German, then I'm specifically not talking about Hungarians, but that does include a number of different ethnic groups, such as Wallachians in the south, in uh, Transylvania, up to Lithuanians in the north. And unfortunately, it's just a facet of having such a huge empire that encompasses a lot of different ethnic groups. I don't want to have to go through them all the time. So German is everyone who's not Hungarian, okay? This is going to be the first of a two-part video, and we'll be concentrating on the line regiments of the Austrian infantry and the grenadiers. We're going to look at the specialist arms, so the Jaegers, the Grenzer, and the Landwehr in the second part of this video. And as with all the other ones, we'll discuss cavalry and artillery in a later video. To understand the Austro-Hungarian army, we first must take a look at the nation itself. As the name suggests, it was not made up of one country, but of a load of combined states. At the start of our period, during the Revolutionary Wars, it goes by its original name, the Holy Roman Empire, which has been famously described as not holy, not Roman, and not an empire. It was a collection of not just Austria and Hungary, but also the countries that today would make up Romania, Poland, Serbia, Croatia, and areas such as Wallachia and Tyrol, as well as Bohemia, which is now in the Czech Republic, and the area that was Slovakia. It was a huge empire that really controlled and consisted of the entirety of Central Europe, from the Baltic in the north right down to the Mediterranean coast in the south. To an organisation as large as the Austrian military, however, there was no real room for such subtlety, at least on paper, and the main line infantry regiments were divided into two types, and that's the differentiation I'll be using today. They were divided into the German and to the Hungarian. It's interesting that when researching this video, a lot of the stereotypes we apply to these nations were either around then or were formed from this separation of the two types. Germans were seen as stoic, well-disciplined and reliable, if not a little bit lazy and fat. Hungarians were regarded alongside the Italians, and weirdly to me anyway, the British as a nation of hot-blooded, fierce fighters, and there was a lot more kudos in defeating a Hungarian unit than a German one. In the official report after the Battle of Engen in May 1800, the French claimed to have pushed eight battalions of Hungarians out of a wood, although there were none present in the army. General Kellerman claimed to have captured 6,000 Hungarian grenadiers at Marengo, and yet there were at most 3,000 grenadiers in the last phases of the battle, and none of them were Hungarian. As we saw in the video on the Kellermans, he could be, uh, shall we say, rather flexible with the truth. Duffy, in his work about the army of the Habsburgs, Instrument of War, says, quote, The Hungarian infantrymen were at their best when they were in the immediate presence of the enemy, which encouraged Armfeld to describe them as among the best of Mia Teresa's foot soldiers, the difficulty was not to get them to fight, but to enlist in the first place. They were convinced that they were unsuited for dismounted service. Obviously, the Hungarians had a very strong tradition of cavalry. Hussars originated in Hungary and spread to the rest of Europe. In an article written in 1855, uh, which was about the sort of the army of Austria and how it had fought in the Napoleonic era, uh, it said, the German and Hungarian infantry generally impose by their solidity and have more than once received cavalry in line without deigning to form square and wherever they have formed squares, the enemy cavalry could seldom break them up. Witness Aspern. Now, when I read this, I was like, can I think of a, an example that uh, Austro-Hungarian square has been broken? And I'll be honest, I can't. I don't know a huge amount about the 1814 uh, period. So possibly there was one there, I don't know. But as far as I'm aware, there was even at you know the disasters of Marengo and Austerlitz. I think it was more that the infantry were caught in line or 
perhaps broken up than they were in square. But if anyone knows, please let me know in the comments down below. I'd be interested to uh, to find that out. But uh, as well as the solidity and like, firmness of the Austro-Hungarian army, they were very outdated almost. In terms of service, were were very 18th century. Service was for life before 1802 and changed to 10 years after that. From 1771, a general cons conscription was in force, a little like we saw for the Russians in their video, or you know, I guess a bit like the Vietnam draft as well, uh, because those who could afford to escape this were able to. So exceptions were made for nobility, clergy, craftsmen, and tradesmen, meaning that the burden fell mostly on the rural poor. Discipline was harsh, not quite up to the Prussian standard though, with corporal punishments being very popular. But as we heard earlier, because of, or perhaps even in spite of, the men were considered to be reliable. In the cavalry, there was also permitted capital punishments, but we'll look more into that in the, uh, the video on the cavalry. The great reformer and commander-in-chief of the army was a tough taskmaster there. That was Archduke Charles. And after the Battle of Aspernesling, in which he arguably inflicted Napoleon's first ever defeat... I think there's an argument to say that it was more of a score draw, but, you know, either way, it was, wasn't the overwhelming victory Napoleon was used to. Uh, Archduke Charles wrote, In general, with some exceptions, I am not satisfied with the conduct of the infantry. The officers had not done their best to keep order, and, quotes, so this is Archduke uh, Charles quoting here, Shouting was so general that commanders could not be heard. Then he uh, continues to write, In the future, the colonels should either keep their regiments quiet, or they would be cashiered, the officers being dismissed. And that's the end of that quote. This victory aside, the victory of Aspen Esling, time and again, even by relatively weak revolutionary armies, the Austrians, this great professional army to come out of the 17th century, sorry, to come out of the 18th century, was absolutely smashed. If the quality of the infantrymen wasn't to blame, as you know, I think we can probably say the Italians or the Spanish infantrymen themselves were not really up to much. If the, the quality of the Austrian wasn't, then what was? Well, that's why I spent so long on the makeup of Austria-Hungary itself. The officers were actually quite well trained for the time, going to a military academy set up by Empress Maria Theresa, who I horrendously mispronounced earlier on. The problem wasn't with the skill of the officers necessarily, it was the fact that they were being trained for the wrong war. The 18th century had seen Austria on the cutting edge of military innovation. Coming out of a near-complete conquest by the Ottomans in 1682, they were determined not to allow this to happen again. They reformed their artillery to be, to be the best in Europe for a 100 years. They introduced both skirmishing light infantry, the so-called Pandors, and pioneered the use of grenadiers, both with and without grenades. Continuing in his work Instrument of War, Duffy writes... The first Austrian grenadiers came into being in 1700, at the height of the European vogue for grenade-throwing heavyweight infantry. They were marked out by their stature, their swarthy complexions, their bristling moustaches, their arrogant demeanour, their grenade marches characterised by alternate passages on the rim and the skin of the drum, and their grenadier caps, end quote. So the, the bare skin that they wore, and you know, all grenadiers began to war, came out of the Austrian way of equipping their grenadiers obviously the british they wore mitres i think it's pretty much the same uh, the same theory though just a slightly different way i did read a um a thing recently that said catholic nations tended to prefer bearskins and protestant ones had mitres uh, that was in a history of war magazine i was reading the other day it's quite random i thought i'd just throw it in because i read it the other day and it was at the, the front of my mind Anyway, so back to the uh, back to the Austrian Hungarian infantry. Um, so, despite being the great innovators of the 18th century, unfortunately, throughout the Napoleonic period, they stayed stuck in that mindset: one of slow-moving, solid, three men deep lines, concentrating on weight of fire rather than the speed of manoeuvre of the French, or perhaps the accuracy and speed of fire that the British could put out. In his book, Napoleon's Great Adversary, Rothenberg wrote, quote, The staff were not capable of handling the corps system. The officers of the quartermaster general staff were primarily trained in mapping, mathematical computations, horsemanship, drawing and penmanship. Many were personally brave, 
and on paper quite capable of elaborating plans for moving troops. In the field, however, it was a different matter. The new system created much confusion, and the Austrian general staff lacked a common doctrine and manuals of procedure. And this became especially critical when, because of the small size of the permanent staff, untrained officers had to be assigned for duty when the army was activated. Now, it must be said that, similarly with the French army in 1804, at their camps in Bologna, uh, large-scale exercises were attempted, particularly under the auspices of uh, Archduke Charles. And in during one such exercise before the Emperor, his, the Archduke's father, at Minkendorf, the cavalry and grenadiers actually began to fight each other, leaving three dead and 60 wounded. So the exercises weren't always a great success. And I think that reflects on not only the disunity of having such a multi-ethnic army, but also perhaps the uh, the lack of of skill and training, shall we say, from the general staff, the lack of control that they could uh, place over their, their command. So the driver of most of these Austrian military reforms, I've mentioned him a couple of times already, uh, and for my money, the Austri by far and away Austria's best military commander was Archduke Charles, and he once said, generals are a weakness in our army. And it wasn't only problems at high command that they had. So I said that the officers were, were reasonably well trained, but there were issues due to the multicultural aspects of the army. Most of the officers would be sons of noblemen, and they would tend to be Austrians, Bohemians perhaps, is probably the furthest that they go. Uh, and because the so-called German regiments could in fact be made up of Czechs, Bohemians, Poles, Walloons, Italians, uh, as we said earlier on, Serbs, Lithuanians, uh, each one of these have their own languages, their own customs, their own way of doing things, even things like their own... Uh, tastes for food and a drink and things like that and because of this there's well there's, rather than let me try and describe it Putnam's Monthly which was the 1855 magazine I mentioned earlier on they have this passage quote the great confusion of nationalities is a serious evil in the British army every man can at least speak English but with the Austrians even the NCOs of the non-German regiments can sparse, can scarcely speak German this creates, of course, a deal of confusion, difficulty and in interpreting, even between officer and the soldier. It is partly remedied by the necessity in which frequent change of quarters places the officers of learning at least something of every language spoken in Austria. But yet, the inconvenience is not obviated. End quote. So although these officers would pick up, you know, a bit of Czech or a bit of Lithuanian, then you know they would uh, rise in favour and they'd suddenly go from that Lithuanian regiment to a Italian one or a Walloon one from Holland, and suddenly you know that bit of uh, language that they've picked up is of absolutely no use whatsoever because none of their new soldiers speak that language. So it's an interesting one. I, I'd imagine for the vast majority of them, the orders were given in German, and the men in the ranks who were multilingual would either translate for their fellow soldiers or everyone would just basically copy what the person next to them was doing. I think that probably happened in all nations' armies when you are in line and you're four, three, four hundred metres away from the command group of your battalion, if you're in extended line, then you kind of just follow what everyone else is doing anyway. Uh, and again, another problem with the... Uh, this idea of doing what everyone else does means that there's not really a great deal of thinking for oneself. We looked in the video on the French; that was one of their great, uh, one of their great bonuses, is that they were willing to have that individual thought. Specifically during the Revolutionary War period, the units were a lot less formal than they were in the later Empire, and I think that's what gave them a massive advantage over the Austrians, certainly in the early pre-1804 campaigns, so up to Marengo, basically. Uh, John Stallart wrote, The Austrian army retained faith in the 18th century constricted manoeuvre at the expense of the less formalised movements employed by the French. In April 1800, Mellis's chief of staff, Baron Zach, expressed the general alliance on old-fashioned, close and linear formations, and here he's quoting Zach, an advance should be courageously 
in closed formation with bands playing and keeping their formation. And then he goes on to say, being, in his opinion, a guarantee of success. Unnecessary skirmishing can only be detrimental, Zach carried on. A determined charge delivered in close order will certainly result in victory with very few casualties. And that's the end of the quote of Zach and of Stalert as well. Although the Austrians did employ skirmishes, they used them very little. So they would form up in three, three ranks when they were in line. And the third rank would skirmish in front of the battalion. They would also use separate units, the excellent Jaegers, and to a lesser extent Grenzers. They would tend to more skirmish for themselves, but we'll cover those in the next video. And unfortunately, when the third rank was sent forward to do it, there was absolutely... The numbers that they sent were completely meaningless. Around 60 to 80 men was considered by high command to be enough to skirmish in front of an entire battalion. Now, we'll talk about the size of Austrian battalions later, but if we consider that a battalion was 1,500 men in three ranks, then a single rank would be 500 men wide. So, by having 60 to 80, uh, you've got, you know, each man is covering, I mean, say it's 80, each man's covering around about six guys behind him, uh, and that's clearly uh, not going to do a huge amount. Of a battalion, it provides a ratio of about one skirmisher for 18 men. The British, they had one company in 10, was a light company. So one in 10. You know, roughly, I mean, you know, we could talk about maybe the elite companies would be smaller than the centre companies. But you know, basically, uh, one in 10 for the British. And the French, one in six. They had six companies in a battalion, and one of those was designated light company. Additionally, the French and British counterparts were full-time light troopers, allowing them to hone their skills that this specific role requires. Again, that independent thought, fire and manoeuvre, aiming, which I know sounds silly, but that's not something that you would necessarily do on a Napoleonic battlefield as a matter of course. Things like that. So by being these professional light infantrymen, they're you know, maybe not up to the extent, the quality of a Jaeger, but they were still better than that third-line Austrian who'd been sent forward to skirmish. Additionally to the third-rank skirmishing, you know, and only 60 to 80 of them, grenadiers were out-and-out out forbidden from skirmishing. They were only to advance in close order, as we saw earlier on. It was believed that that would be the decisive formation to destroy the enemy, and that was the role of the grenadiers. Again, we'll, we'll come on to that later. So the, uh, so the first thing that we want to talk about when talking about Austro-Hungarian units in particular, and this is going to apply to infantry and cavalry, is that they were absolutely massive. A regiment in the field would have well, o well over a 1,000 men. On paper, it would be over 2,000, but field strength was roughly about the 1,500 mark. When Austria declared war on France in 1897, the infantry consisted of over 300,000 men the majority of which were in line regiments. These regiments would have different coloured facings, uh, including uh, two of my favourite ones, either the official colours, Madder Red, <laughs> which I know like the, the word Madder comes from, I think it's the plant that it's made out of, it, just, it always makes me chuckle, uh, and Apple Green, which is which is quite nice, I quite like those two. I think they also, they also certainly had a regiment with pink facings, but I always paint the pink facings first if I can. Um, and... The, uh, there were some, <laughs> so this custom for naming regiments after their in harbour or their colonel, I've almost certainly pronounced that, that wrong, so apologies if I have, um, were a tradition that had gone back to the Marlborough Wars and even before to a certain extent, but some allowances for modernity did exist. As with most of the regiments of the time, an Austro-Hungarian infantry regiment had three battalions, two of which were field battalions and one which was a depot or training one. So very similar to the Russians. The field battalions were known as the Lieb and the Oberst and each had six fusilier companies in addition to two grenadier companies. Now these grenadier companies were there purely for administrative purposes. In the field they would always be detached from their parent units and form what was known as a grenadier reserve. Again similar to the Russians. I think the Austrians placed more emphasis on their Grenadier Reserve than the Russians did. I've got absolutely no evidence for this, but that's just 
Just my sort of feeling from reading different battles and things like that. Line infantrymen were similarly to French units, unlike the Russians, trained on the march. For example, in 1805, Archduke Ferdinand reported, quote, Since many of our newly arrived troops have still to be trained in musketry, I approve the issue of six live rounds to be fired by every such man. End quote. So, so that was it. You, <laughs> you'd get six rounds, you'd fire them, and then you were now fully trained. So, again, another potential issue there was that these units were spending far more time on drill and discipline than actual combat skills. It's great to have a nicely chalked uniform and whitened belts. Absolutely brilliant. But when you've only fired six shots in your entire life, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd go with the guys who fired a lot more than the guys who have the better uniforms, I have to say. A line company. So, remember, we had uh, six of these. A line company consisted of 180 men in German regiments and 200 in Hungarian, whilst grenadiers were 120 and 140 respectively. So if we're going to use 1 to 20 figures, that leads to line battalions of about 48 figures, slightly larger if you're Hungarian, although these are paper strengths, of course. So around about um, 48 figures is fine for both of those, I think. And Grenadiers, I run units of 30 Grenadiers, which is a bit awkward, I have to say. Uh, I base mine in sixes. If I was going to base them in fours, I'd probably go with... I'm just thinking this off the fly. I'd probably go with 32, because that would give me eight bases, which would be a bit easier to uh, show on the battlefield. So, yeah. I, I, anyway, definitely large regiments for Black Powder, as far as Black Powder is concerned, though. Uniforms were uh, all troops wore a single breasted white. It was actually slightly off white uh, coat. Uh, a lot more I'm seeing now Austrian armies that aren't painted white. They would probably be more of a of a unbleached wool colour. But for me, Austrians are white. I always paint mine white. It's slightly historically inaccurate, but uh, hey, whatever. Uh, whereas the German regiments would have worn white trousers, Hungarian infantry wore tight blue breeches with yellow knot decoration. Uh, They also wore over-the-knee gaiters as well. Uh, Facings, as I said earlier on, would be different colours to identify different regiments, similarly to the British. And one of the big things that did change for the Austrians was headwear. Headdress for the line changed throughout the period, with first militants, similar to those worn by hussars, being popular, particularly in those border units and Hungarian ones. Uh... After that, they were replaced with leather leather casks or leather crested helmets. I always call them fireman helmets because I think they look a little bit like that. With a black dyed woolen comb on the top, edged in yellow. They look quite cool on the on the tabletop. In 1805, after the disaster of the Austerlitz campaign, they were replaced with much cheaper to produce shakos. But it says something for uniform logistics that by 1809 and the Danube campaign. Only the Hungarian regiments had received them, meaning that the German regiments still fought in their helmets. After this campaign, however, they would all be in shakos. Throughout the whole period, one type of headdress that didn't change was that of the Grenadiers. They wore tall, false-fronted bearskins throughout the conflict. With the rear, it's like a bag that hangs down, uh, matching their facings. As an aside, when we went to Waterloo 200 in 2015... There was a detachment of Austrian Grenadiers. That, I, I, I don't know why they were there. But they looked super cool. It was nice to see them anyway. And their bearskins had got wet. And where that false front was, they kind of like flapped up and down. A bit like a soggy slipper. So yeah, no, I, was, <laughs> I, was, I was a little bit disappointed to see them in the flesh. But uh, it was nice to see them anyway. It was nice for them to join in. Uh, one thing I do like about these Austrian units is that on the tabletop, they've got a real presence. They're big units. The white uniforms, nice with the facings. They, they look really cool on the tabletop. And not only on the tabletop, Chalapowski of the Polish Imperial Lancers wrote, uh, this is in, I think it was 1809 he wrote this, The most beautiful sight I have ever seen in my life then unfurled before our eyes. Within a radius of about a mile, we could see the entire Austrian army with its right flank anchored on the Danube and its left extending beyond Wagram. So, yeah, yeah, it was 18, I As we've seen above, line and column were the main infantry formations. And as the war progressed in 1807, Archduke Charles reformed the infantry drill manual and introduced a new formation, the battalion mass. Uh, 
Using the sheer number of men in an Austrian battalion, they made a tightly packed formation, even tighter than one in which other nations would call a closed column, so even tighter than a French column. It was almost a combination of column of attack and a square, meaning that it could both repel cavalry, yet still move quickly. The downside was that it presented a very packed mass of men, and Napoleon's daughters would wreak a terrible havoc on them. And as I was writing this, I was thinking, they also fought the Russians as well. So a tightly packed mass of men against a 12-pound is pretty bad. Against Russian 20-pounder unicorn guns, though, it must have been absolutely horrific. Just, oh, oh, terrible. The Austrians, however, had very little occasion to form square. I was I, against the French in particular because of their numerous and superb cavalry. The cavalry were regarded as being the best in Europe. Again, we'll come back to this in the cavalry video. Um, in, in fact, they probably were considered the best in the world, actually, not just in Europe. Line units were used in combat, particularly as you'd expect any line unit to be. But the Grenadiers, however, were held back in the Russian method as a Grenadier Reserve. Here, three or four converged battalions of Grenadiers would await the order to either attack or break and break through a wavering enemy, or to bolster a, a line that seemed to be fragile. Grenadier battalions were smaller than their line counterparts, consisting of about 600 men. And as I said earlier on, I, I tend to use 30 figures. Something that I quite like to do is I paint half the figures with one type of facing and half the figures with another. I try and get them to match my line units, just because I think it adds a little bit more to the uh, to the army, a little bit more personality. As we saw, they were used as shock troops to assault enemy strong points, one of the, the famous ones being the Granary Essling. They were large men and had to have served for at least five years and participated in at least one campaign. Austrian Grenadiers certainly could shoot, but they weren't afraid of the bayonet either. For example, in 1799 at Novi, two Grenadier battalions stormed a hill defended by Wittrin's French infantry and captured it without even stopping to fire. We saw in the Old Guard video that the Old Guard is something similar. Although the French were difficult to dislodge from the vineyards and buildings on top of this hill, uh, a further seven Grenadier battalions outflanked the French to their rear, forcing them to withdraw. Later, during Suvorov's campaign in Italy, an Austrian Grenadier battalion deployed into line before stopping and firing volleys into the flank of the French columns. There was about 2,000 men of three battalions of the 5th Light Infantry, apparently. Whilst this sent the French reeling, they did not break. So, then the Austrian Grenadiers charged, bayonets fixed. The French hastily retreated with the Grenadiers still following them in line. Suvorov was so impressed that he decorated the captain in command with the Maria Theresa Order on the spot. So that was you know, a bit like being inducted to the Legion d'Honneur or Paul le Merite in the Prussian army. The final example of Austrian Grenadier daring do is one that I slightly touched on earlier on. Um, in fact, no, I'll have another one after this one. Uh, but another uh, example of Austrian Grenadier daring do was at the Battle of Aspen Essling. Uh, Napoleon had ordered the newly created Young Guard to recapture the village of Essling. Now, everyone knew what to expect, as in the village of Essling were several battalions of Austrian grenadiers, but the young guard had a lot to prove. The guard triers stopped the advance of the Austrian grenadiers, but their own impetus was stalled. Napoleon supported the triers with the guard fusiliers. Together, they pushed the grenadiers out of the village. However, Napoleon's guard paid a heavy price for the victory. Generals Mouton, Gross, and Curial about a quarter of the rank and file were either killed or wounded. Too many for all their ambulances to cope with. The young guard were so enraged at the heavy losses that they bayoneted the wounded and crippled grenadiers. Now, the um, General Gloss I mentioned there, he was the one who Napoleon described as swimming through gunpowder like a fish in water. These weren't, you know, puny soldiers or the Mary Theresas that would join the young guard later. These were, were quite highly trained Imperial Guardsmen, very experienced. So, although the Grenadiers were pushed out of the village, they, they fought hard. And, you know, you can't really ask more than that, can you? Later in that campaign at Vagram, the Austrian Grenadiers smashed the French 24th Light Infantry Regiment and captured its eagle. Again, the 24th, no ingenues they. They were a superb unit carrying on its colour six battle honours. A battalion of Hessians also suffered very heavy losses. 
losing one of their flags. And as the Austrians, there's a bit of a story here, as the Austrian grenadiers overwhelm the desperate Hessians, the battalion's two standard bearers, Kempf and Bornmann, struggle to rescue their precious flags. Kempf was captured, but managed to free himself and hid in a dovecot until he could make his way back to his comrades. Bornman, however, courageously defended his charge, refusing to surrender, and was finally killed by a musket butt to the head. So tight was his death grip that the Austrians had to cut off his hand to seize the flag. Also, at the Battle of Wagram, it was an Austrian grenadier that fired the shot that, in my, in my humble estimation, ended the years of glory, the shot that killed General LaSalle. Just to go back as well to the Battle of Aspen Essling, I mentioned they attacked the granary. At one point, they were or- they had to be ordered by Archduke Charles himself not to launch another attack. They were going in, they'd been fought off seven or eight times, they were going to go back for another one, and Archduke Charles rode up to them and forbade them to attack. A roll call the next morning, there were 14 men left out of that battalion of nearly 600. Now, the rest of them weren't necessarily all killed, there would have been some injured. But it just really goes to show the tenacious mindset of, in this case, German infantry, but I imagine the dash and land of Hungarian infantry would have been pretty much the same as well. And that's that's really it on Austrian line infantry. They're, they're, they're an interesting bunch. They're sort of seen as being a bit vanilla. I think the white uniforms doesn't help. And the fact that they didn't really win a battle probably doesn't help either. But I hope I've I've put some shed some light on the fact that it wasn't necessarily the quality of the troops and it wasn't even necessarily the quality of the commander's individual skill but it was that they were just they were just fighting the wrong war they were fighting the seven years war and napoleon had completely torn up the rule book on what what warfare was and I, I think that was the main problem the austrians had they just they were just such a huge empire and such a huge army that they just weren't able to modernize as quickly as the French or the Prussians did, uh, or the British as well. Um, you know, they, they underwent a huge modernization. So, they're solid, they're numerous, they are completely outdated. I, I want to quickly go through how Black Powder has them. It's a little bit strange because we've only got one period to assess them by, and that's a very specific and not really that common. Uh, period it's the post 1812 one now i think it does a fine job of representing the army after this period the battalion mass is quite a good rule the triple shotting at close range is a weird one they they talk about using effectively three pistol balls and firing them all at once now i'll be honest i've not found any evidence for this whatsoever but I, i'm assuming that the author of uh, clash of eagles which is where you can find the stats for the austrians has uh, so I, I'm happy to take his word for that one. Um, however, because the Austrians were France's most implacable foe, it meant that they lend themselves to quite a few incarnations, each of their own flavour. As I said, I mean, you know, we start the period there, the Holy Roman Empire. It wasn't until 1805 that uh, that, that was got rid of completely. So, I mean, that is an example of some of the changes. I think we'll probably go back from the 1812 and work our way up to the Holy Roman Army, though. In, uh, in 1809, uh, with the Danube campaign, it's after the reforms of Archduke Charles. So, on the road to being what the army was in 1812, they hadn't quite been fully implemented. And for that reason, it's one of my favourite periods to war game. I keep the stats for the units the same. Perhaps I'd cap the generals at strategy rating 7. Maybe I'd give Archduke Charles an 8. Maybe, if he's the overall commander, perhaps he allows two re-rolls a game at a turn. Sorry, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that one. Uh, I'd also, and this might be a little bit much, so you can take this one or you can leave it, but I might suggest that units can either form in battalion mass, as you know, as the rules presented in 1812, in the, the Clash of Eagles, sorry, or they can uh, go in line or column, but if they're in battalion mass, they must stay in battalion mass for the entire game. Just to represent the fact that the officers weren't perhaps quite up to up to snuff when it came to changing formation and things like that. It's quite limited, so I'm, that's a bit, bit hardcore, that one. It's easy to remember, but it's a bit hardcore. One that's maybe a little bit more difficult to remember and is a bit of a compromise, though, might be to form another formation from battalion mass or to form battalion mass it takes two successful moves to do so 
normally you'd go column to line and you know that's that you can do that on a successful roll well you might need two successes if you want to go from battalion mass to line so either of those i think might work again they're only suggestions uh, for 1805 I think we would need quite a bit more difference. I've been thinking about 1805 quite a lot, actually. Um, so, again, I'd keep the units as individual stats the same. I'd impose more restrictions on them, though. I'd cap the strategy rating at hard 6. I don't think anyone should be above 6. And battalion mass is not a legitimate formation. They didn't use battalion mass before that time. Uh, I'd also limit brigade orders to brigades that consist of units of only one nation. So that's either German or Hungarian units. And in 1805, of course, we've also got Russian units. So no no brigade orders if you've got a Hungarian unit in with your Germans, and absolutely no brigade orders. In fact, I'd even say no brigade orders and minus one to order if you've got Russians in the same brigade as well. Again, that might be a little, little harsh. Um, so I think an alternative would be these mixed brigades, and I use that term uh, with inverted commas, the mixed brigades get unreliable. So if you're a unit in a, um, in a mixed brigade, then you just get unreliable. That, that's another potential way of doing it. If we're going to go back even further to the armies of the Holy Roman Empire and those who fought the revolutionary armies of you know 1792 through to, to 1800, really, then I would go with, and this is, this is super radical, I think the other ones have been a bit out there, I'd go with the list from the last argument of kings. Now, I haven't playtested this. I haven't really looked into it, I have to say. It was just something that came to me. It's an interesting thought. I'm sure that you'll think. But, uh, yeah, no. Uh, try try it. See how it works. It's the same like rule set overall. So try how a Seven Years' War army would go up against a Napoleonic army. Because effectively that's what it was. That, that's what was happening. I think the French need quite a few um, modifications for the revolutionary armies as well. But but yeah, try it out. I, I certainly think that's where the starting point for an 1806 Prussian army would be. So I don't see why that shouldn't be the case for a very early Austrian army as well. So that's it. That's it for Lion and Grenadiers on the Austrians. The next video, I'm hopefully going to release it soon. Uh, you always know how soon on is on this channel it may not be as soon as, as you as you think uh but next up i'm going to try and get the specialist infantry run recorded so the jaegers grenzer and landveer so hopefully it won't be too much wait for that those of you who are staying at home because of the current illnesses that are out there stay safe best of luck i hope i'm sure we've all got lead and plastic mountains that we can be uh be chopping through uh, send me some of your your projects send uh, send some pictures either on the facebook page or like uh, you know tell me what you're up to here please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video i'm noticing that a lot of views are coming from non-subscribers so if you want to keep up with what's going on then uh, then please subscribe i probably won't get much time off over this period uh, as i'm an nhs worker but hopefully I'll be able to get some videos out at least as frequently as I currently do. So, uh, yes, it's not particularly frequently, is it? Let's be honest. But uh, everyone stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.